And because of this, the phrases started this foundation. And at the inception of this, Allison came to visit us at Wake Forest and talked to the director of that institute, Tony Atala, and asked, as a mother, what would be the most transformative thing I could do to accelerate the research to bring a therapy for this disease to my child? And Tony said, without equivocation, find a large animal model. If you do that, you can knock a decade off of the drug development time that it takes to bring a drug to market. So to understand what comes next, you have to know a little bit about Allison. She's the most sophisticated, smart, elegant woman you never want to meet, but don't mess with her. Like so many mothers, she won't take no for an answer. She won't listen. She won't accept that things are too hard, too difficult. They take too long. So Allison set out to find a large animal model for this disease. In a meeting much like this, a veterinary pathologist named Diane Shelton put up a slide, a histology slide of muscle from a dog that had a muscle disease. And sitting in the audience was one of my close colleagues, Alan Beggs from Harvard. And Alan went, hey, that could be a central nuclear myopathy. And I'll show you what, I'll tell you what that means in a minute. So therein started the search for the dog that had the litter of pups who all died because they had that muscle disease. So what Allison did was call Diane Shelton. Sorry, in the bottom there, that's supposed to be a picture of a dog, but the, PC to, the Mac to PC conversion messed up a couple slides. So Allison calls Diane and says, where's the dog that gave birth to those pups who all died? And it turns out the dog, the mother, belonged to a farmer in Saskatchewan. Canada. So Allison, three days after Christmas, 2009, flew to Saskatchewan and knocked on the door of the farmer and said, the litter of pups that you just had that died might have the same disease my son has. Can we borrow your dog? And of course, the farmer's like, yes, of course, <laughs> take my dog. So that weekend, Allison put the dog in a crate, got on a plane, and delivered Nibs to us at Wake Forest. And Nibs is the founding mother of the colony that we now have at the University of Washington. And we got lucky. Later that year, Nibs delivered a litter of 12 pups. And in that litter, there were five carrier females and one affected male. So later the next year, Alan Beggs, back into the picture, he did all of the genetics and determined that Nibs did indeed carry a mutation in this gene called MTM1. That's the causative mutation for myotubular myopathy. So then, all of a sudden, we were studying myotubular myopathy, a disease I had never heard of. And what comes next is Nibs produces uh, a bountiful set of animals that we can then use to study this disease. So what you're looking at is six years of a canine colony. The green arrows are the carrier females who are still in the colony at UW that we lean on all the time to produce new animals to do our experiments. The two males toward the bottom that are in the red circle those are Pavlov and Turing. Those are the first two proof of concept animals that gene therapy could work in this disease in large animals. And remember that, I'll come back to that in a minute. Another part of the heartwarming story is what's around the outside of this pedigree are pictures of all of the normal control animals who have served their time in our studies and then we were able to adopt them out. Yeah, very good. very good, yeah. Mostly 
to families who have boys with this disease. So my office is decorated with pictures of Will or Ian or one of these boys cuddling next to the dog under the Christmas tree. So if, if that doesn't get you, I don't, I don't want to know you. <laughs> I'll, I'll come to that. It's, no, no, that's okay. The, the gene is on the X chromosome, so uh, it's only uh, inherited in boys. So the mother is the carrier, unknown most of the time, and passes on the mutation to boys. No, that's fine. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the disease. So XLMTM is the most common form of this myopathy that we call a central nuclear myopathy, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute. The worldwide incidence is listed as one in 50,000, but we think this is at least five-fold underdiagnosed because very few hospitals have the molecular kits to test uh, whether this is the mutation in play when a baby is born floppy meaning they have no muscle tone. Their muscles will never contract. Most of their large major skeletal muscles will never contract. So as you can imagine, from birth, these boys are in really bad shape. They are uh, absolutely dependent on a ventilator, and that requires the mobilization of an entire family to take care of these boys. And in just a quick sideline, you might, if you think about this for a minute, you might imagine that with current insurance, reimbursement, and things like that, oftentimes these families turn their garage or their basement into a medical supply facility because you never know when the little plastic coupler that links your ventilator to the trach tube is going to be discontinued. So they buy when insurance will cover it, they buy tons of these supplies because you never know when somebody is going to change manufacturers or change something that fits that your son absolutely needs for his survival. So all I'm trying to do is give you an impression of what it takes and the burden on the families that it takes to take care of these boys. As you can see on the right, they also suffer from this characteristic facial dysmorphology. Um, Without going into the embryology, the developmental biology of it, there's also a bone defect. So uh, as the, for the boys who have the milder form of the disease, as they get older, say 10 or 12 years old, you always see this long, narrow face. And like I said, most of the boys don't live more than two years. And those that do survive um, will require an enormous amount of care. And again, it's chronic respiratory insufficiency that leads to spontaneous respiratory failure. Almost all of the boys succumb to the disease when we get a couple of times a year messages that in the night uh, Bobby's ventilator malfunctioned and that was it. So there's a huge unmet medical need here. There are two efforts to try to treat this disease. One is what's called an enzyme replacement therapy. Valerion Therapeutics is trying to do this which means they're trying to make boatloads of this recombinant protein called myotubularin and infuse this into the boy's muscles. Uh, they were successful at first. We haven't heard anything from them in a few years, so I don't know what kind of progress they're making. But what I'm going to tell you about today is our efforts to take on this strategy of what we call gene replacement therapy. So, the pathology is widespread. It affects all the skeletal muscles. But luckily, for our purpose of doing gene therapy, the pathology is not progressive. What do I mean by that? So most of you are familiar with muscle diseases that are dystrophies, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which means there are cycles of degener muscle degeneration and attempted regeneration and that breakdown buildup, breakdown buildup 
leads to excessive fibrosis and scar tissue. That's not what this is. The muscle is more or less intact, but it's missing a key component that will ever keep it from, or that will ever allow it to contract. That's what makes it a good candidate for gene therapy. The hallmark of the disease is small muscle fibers. They look fetal, even as an adult. The boys can be 10 or 12 years old and their muscle fibers look fetal. Another hallmark is this internal disorganization of the organelles, like mitochondria, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So on the lower left, you can see a cross-section of what normal skeletal muscle looks like. You see very large, robust bundles of muscle fibers, very little connective tissue, and the nuclei, those little blue dots, the nuclei are all pushed to the periphery. That's what normal muscle looks like. The disease state on the right, you see much smaller muscle bundles, a lot of connective tissue, and here's where the central nuclear myopathy diagnosis comes from. Because of this breakdown in the cytoskeleton, the nuclei kind of gravitate toward the middle of the muscle fiber, and that's where it got its historical, histological diagnosis. So what is the MTM1 gene? Again, thanks for the question. It's located on the distal long arm of the X chromosome. MTM1 is a founding member of this family of 15 genes. It's ubiquitously expressed. We know much more about what it does in muscle than we know about what it does in any other tissue. There are over 300 different mutations identified so far that run the gamut from very severe, where the fetus won't, uh, they die in utero, to a moderate form, that's what we think we're studying, to a more mild form, those are the boys that live to be 10 or 15 years old. And for those molecular people in the audience, this gene was originally identified as a phosphoinositide lipid phosphatase. I know that's a big mouthful. But what that means is it has to do with lipids. And its role is in uh, endosome, vacuole, vesicle, fusion, and fission. Okay? That's all you need to know for that. <laughs> but this is the muscle part. This is what MTM does in the muscle. It's involved with excitation, contraction, coupling in the neuromuscular junction. So for those of you who don't think about muscle all the time, this is the machinery that turns the neural stimulation from your brain and translate that into a signal that your muscles use to contract, okay? I'll refer to it as EC coupling. Very important for the rest of the talk. It's also involved in the lower left, you can see it's also involved in triad formation. In the muscle, what are triads? You can think about this as small tubules. This is the plumbing of the muscle, which means if you think about your bicep, molecularly speaking, it's a big muscle. So how can your bicep contract nearly instantaneously? How does that signal from your brain propagate into the muscle and allow that muscle to contract so fast? It's because of these triads these small tubules that propagate the calcium flux. Muscle contraction is all based on calcium flux. What propagates that signal are these tubules within your muscle. It's also involved with intermediate filament formation. That's what forms the, the internal cytoskeleton within the muscle that gives it its structure. When you bite into a steak, it's that that gives resistance, that's the extracellular matrix that you're biting into. Without that function, that's what causes the nuclei to fall into the middle of the cell and the mitochondria to be mislocalized. Okay, so that's the patient population. I've told you about the, the disease a little bit. How are we going to approach this therapeutically? We're going to do that using gene therapy, gene replacement therapy. What do I mean by that? So in my institute, the Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine, one of the credos, one of the things we live by is we are no longer satisfied to combat or counteract symptoms. Our goal is to address the disease at the root cause of the problem. 
So I've shown you that this disease is caused by a mutation in a gene. So why not replace with the normal copy of the gene? That's what we're trying to do. The way we do that is depicted cartoon-like here. We use a virus called an adeno-associated virus. And using recombinant DNA technology, we splice out everything that makes that virus replicative and infective, and we splice in what we want that virus to deliver, the cargo. And in our case, what that is, is shown in the red. We clone in the normal MTM1 copy of the gene under a promoter, which is just an element that causes the gene to be expressed. The promoter is muscle specific. So even if the virus goes to liver or lung or wherever, this gene won't get turned on. It only gets turned on in muscle. And then we take advantage of an inherent quality of this virus. It has a tropism for muscle. It wants to go to muscle. That's its preferential target. So we take advantage of all that. And here comes the challenging part. We have to manufacture this virus. This is not a small molecule. This is not a drug per se. This is a whole new category of treatment. So imagine how long and how difficult it is to bring a single drug to market that's a small molecule, something the FDA has been doing forever. Now imagine the complexity of what it takes to bring a complex biologic like this to the market. That's the big challenge. Adding to the challenge is that we have to make 10 to the 15th copies, a thousand trillion particles to administer to one dog. It's very, very expensive. The therapy in one dog is almost $100,000. That will come down. But experimentally, that's what we're dealing with. So we depend on all these properties of the virus to enter in through the cell and deliver this cargo into the nucleus of the muscle cells. That's gene therapy. So to summarize five or six years worth of work in one slide, a lot of this was done by Anna at Genathon. She created this virus and the genetics that goes inside the virus. Again, it's the MTM1 gene along with this muscle-specific promoter. She packaged it into a virus and gave it to her knockout mouse and showed that she could basically cure the animals. We picked up that technology, and in our lab and with Casey, we did intramuscular injections and regional hind limb perfusion, which is just a delivery technique we don't need to talk about, to show that we could prolong survival, restore muscle strength, reverse the muscle pathology, and it, the six things we measured, there's no immunological consequences, and I'll come back to that. And that work was published two years ago in Science Translational Medicine. Hot off the presses, remember when I showed you the pedigree, I asked you to remember Pavlov and Turing. I'm really excited to report that last week we did the assessments on Pavlov and Turing four years post-gene therapy, and they're fine. They're happy dogs running around, and we can't see any indication that this gene therapy is wearing off, okay? Okay, so what I want to go through really quickly, I'm going to show you the data, but I'm only going to give you the take-home message of what we think the data means. This is a dose-finding study, because, okay, we're trying to get this approved by the FDA, so we have to jump through certain hoops and prove to them that it's effective and safe. So we did a dose-finding study that's going to parallel what we're going to do in the boys, which means we're going to give one intravenous injection so this is not a continuing therapy. The initial therapy is gonna be very expensive. But if you think about the nursing care, 24 hour care, that's much more expensive than one potential successful therapy that costs a lot of money up front. So keep that in mind. So I'm gonna share the data with you. Uh, so again, the top picture is supposed to be a dog. So 22 animals in this study, we split them into five groups, either the normals, XLMTM plus saline, I'll probably call that affected, untreated, 
and then three dosage groups. And for our purposes, we'll just call them low, medium, and high. And then we assess these animals every way we could think of. Of course, we're going to look at survival, but we also tested limb strength, respiratory function. We measure how the dogs walk and run quantitatively. We've de developed a, neuro a neurological assessment score um, that we think will be used to help us as we do the clinical translation. We also measure vector copy number, MTM transgene expression, how much protein, this MTM protein that we're introducing, how much of that is around. And then, of course, we want to look at restoration of the structure of the muscle at the histological level and then look at the immune response. So the study plan looks like this. At nine weeks of age, the dogs undergo this acclimation testing. We just need to get a baseline. Where are they in their disease? And then a week later, at 10 weeks, we either give them saline or one of those dosages of the gene therapy. And then there are, all of the assessments are repeated every two weeks early and then once a month later in the study out to almost a year. And then we take muscle biopsies at various times so we can sample this purported rescue of the muscle function. One of the things I need to tell you about is we've always been um, uh, pleased with how well this dog model matches the human condition. However, they're not exactly the same. As I told you, when the boys are born, they're in pretty rough shape. However, the dogs, when they're born, they look okay. It takes a real trained eye to see which dogs have the mutation and which ones don't. However, it doesn't take long <laughs> for anybody to be able to see what's happening. So between birth and about 20 weeks of age, they have a rapid, very reproducible decline in their disease. So in this study, we chose to treat them at 10 weeks of age. So you can think about that as it's about halfway down their progression. We can start to see overt signs of the pathology, but yet they're not in any immediate risk of dying. Why is that important? We just gave them a boatload of gene therapy that's very expensive. The one mistake we did not want to make is treat them with $100,000 worth of gene therapy and then have the animal die and we would have nothing to study. So that was, a, that was less a scientific approach, more of a practical, let's not screw this up approach. So here's the data. It's going to come kind of fast and furious, but I think it all holds together with a, with a unified message. If you look at the survival curves, the Kaplan-Meier plots, in red you can see the affected untreated animals all die by four months. The affected low dose treated in green, they survive a little longer, they, but they all eventually succumb to the disease. However, the blue and the yellow, the mid-dose and high-dose treated dogs all survive until the end of the study. Next thing we want to measure is their gait. So we have a gait carpet where they just run and walk and the sensors in the gate carpet pick up their footfalls, and we can quantitate that, and we can determine things like gate velocity and stride length and things like that. So just because a result is simple does not mean it's unimportant. What's shown in black is the different, so this is the different treatment groups, the saline, low, medium, and high. The black is what a normal dog's velocity looks like, the blue band is the, the um, confidence interval of how those normal dogs walk. So in the red, the affected untreated animals, they continue to decline. They slow down until they die. Skip to the bottom. In the purple and kind of yellow, you can see that after gene therapy, even though the dogs are substandard early, they quickly come, in, come up into the normal range. So they're starting to walk faster. Our principal outcome measure for efficacy has always been muscle strength. We want to look at how their muscles function. So what we do is, under anesthesia, so the dogs aren't feeling anything, we hook them up to these various gantry systems, and we hook them to a torque motor, and all we're doing is asking them to push 
or pull against this torque motor after we directly stimulate their nerves with an electrical signal so we can measure how strong they are just by how they push and pull on the paddle. So you're looking at, on the upper two panels, that's forelimb extension and flexion. The bottom two panels are hind limb extension and flexion. On the x-axis is how old they are, so this is as the dogs get older. On the y-axis is their torque, that's how much force they're able to produce. So in, all of, in, the, in the upper left and the bottom two, just appreciate that the affected untreated and the low dose treated animals all get worse until they die. They continue to decline. They get weaker and weaker as they get older. However, in the hind limb extension and the two bottom graphs, the force that these mutant treated animals are able to produce is approaching normal or indistinguishable from normal. So at a certain age, we can't tell the difference. We're all blinded to what's in, you know, who's in who's, what's treatment group. So we can't tell a difference between the, the treated animals and the normal animals. But there's another interesting observation here, especially to this audience. We all want to know if we're going to use animals for these types of studies, it better be a really good model of the disease or you're taking an incredibly precious resource and using it frivolously. I'm proud of the fact that this, the phenotype of these animals, dramatically, the fidelity with which it mimics the human condition is very good, and this is one of the examples. So what I didn't tell you is, in the boy's condition, even when they're really advanced, the last thing to go is this. Their whole world revolves around being able to communicate with their families by iPads, by typing. So in other words, they have four limb flexion. This is a movement that they never really lose. In our animal model, you can see the only measurement that we can't tell a difference between any of the groups is in four limb flexion. So I'm trying to convince you that this is a, a physiological indication that the dog model very closely matches what we see in the boys. The single most burdensome part of this disease to those patients and their families is the fact that the boys are on a ventilator. Imagine bath time. How do you bathe a child when you're worried that how long the bath takes is going to keep him off his ventilator? So the whole world, all of the discipline it takes to be completely devoted to the ventilator is a major burden. So if we can improve the muscle, the diaphragmatic function in these boys to help their breathing even a little bit, it would be truly transformative for these patients. So to try to measure that, we put what's called a pneumotac, which is a little device that measures air flow, and we put that between the trach tube and the ventilator when the dogs are under anesthesia when we're doing our experiments. And then we give them what's called Dopram, which is a brain stem muscle stimulant. Because you can't tell the dog, hey, take a deep breath. So we have to very aggressively make them breathe deeply. And then we measure this flow. And what this flow creates is the so-called flow volume loops here. So you can see inspiration and expiration. So this keeps going as a cycle, inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. And what we've chosen to measure is this so-called peak inspiratory flow, which means we think it's a good measure of how strong they are because if you think about how a dog breathes when it's running, when it's exerting itself, it has to be able to form that vacuum that allows you to breathe in. So how quickly and how aggressively can their diaphragm contract and give them the capability to breathe deeply? So that's what we're measuring. If we take these flow volume loops and just measure them over and over and over again and plot them, from this slide all I want you to gather is that as we increase the dose of gene therapy, their flow volume loops get bigger 
and it gets more regular in this kind of characteristic D shape. If we take all of that data and quantitate it, this becomes very complicated. The analysis here is really complicated. I don't have time to go into it. But the only major method or the only major conclusion I want to leave you with is if you plot all of this data and compare it to normal dogs, the respiratory function of a normal dog is plotted in black and it's repeated each on, on each graph just so you can compare. If you look at the affected untreated in red or the affected low dose in green, those are below normal. So these dogs are breathing slowly, they're breathing shallowly, and they fatigue very quickly. Now shift your attention to the bottom. If you look at the purple and the yellow orange, you can see that after gene therapy, we're able to normalize their respiratory function or even go slightly above normal, meaning that these dogs are breathing more regularly, more deeply, suggesting that we've uh, recovered their diaphragmatic strength. And it's not advancing. Oh, there. Oh. Okay. So now we come to the most, the, my, what I find the most fun. Have we fixed the muscle at the structural level? So again, what you're looking at on the left is what a normal muscle looks like in cross section. In the middle is the affected untreated group, and you can see that they're smaller, irregularly shaped muscle fibers, and they also have this characteristic, what's called necklace fibers. This is just a specific stain that histo uh, uh, histologists use to look at mitochondrial localization. And in this disease, the mitochondria get mislocalized to the periphery, and they form these necklace fibers. That's very characteristic of this disease. And in the far right panel, you can see under, after mid-dose gene therapy, uh, it looks like a normal muscle. And reviewers of this paper wanted us to use very specific terms. The proper way to say this is that the affected mid-dose treated muscle is indistinguishable from normal. So there you go. So if I could break from kind of classic stoic scientific speak for just a minute, this result, it, I'm most proud of this result because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the restoration of the structures that have caused the disease. And again, this is the goal in regenerative medicine. We're fixing the root cause of the problem. So remember I told you about these T-tubules, the, the plumbing of the muscle. The panel on the left shows a diseased muscle. And for those of you who have, might have ever seen this before, this is what skeletal muscle looks like under the electron microscope. Remember in your grammar school, you probably learned about actin and myosin and how they overlap. They interdigitate and pull on each other. That's what you're looking at in that middle panel, okay? That's actin and myosin at the molecular level. And you can see that there are no T-tubules. On the right, this is our mid-dose, one of the mid-dose treated dogs, and you can see that the number of T-tubules in the muscle has been completely restored. And just to give you an up-close look at that, the circles, so in the lower right, the circles with that little dash in the middle, that's the triad, okay, the three structures. So this shows unequivocally that we have rescued the muscle structure at the ultrastructural level. Okay, remember I said we're trying to get this drug approved. It's not a typical drug, but we still have to get approval from the FDA. So what the FDA wants to know are the things that they've always wanted to know, like What's the biodistribution? How are you delivering this? How effectively are you delivering this drug to the body? If you think about this for a minute, what's the largest tissue in your body? Some people say the skin by surface area, but it's really what makes up your mass is your muscles. So imagine the daunting task of saying, we're gonna deliver a gene to enough muscle cells in the dog to restore function over the entire animal, okay? So that's what the FDA wants to know. How effectively have we done that? So 
All this shows is that by a heat map, this technology was also developed in the lab for this paper, we developed the algorithm that can turn quantitative PCR data into a colorimetric heat map to show various densities. Kind of proud of that too. All you can see is that the more gene therapy we give the dogs, the more viral vectors we're able to find in those muscles. And again, that's what the FDA wants to know. Similarly, how much MTM1 protein have you delivered to the muscles? Because that's the true drug. The vector is just the, the, the delivery mechanism. How much transgenic protein is being made in the muscles to restore function? So all you're seeing here is another heat map that as we increase the dose, the amount of MTM1 protein also goes up. Again, a simple readout, but translationally speaking, I'm hoping very powerful. So a very talented veterinary pathologist in the lab, Jessica Snyder, developed this neurological assessment score. And it goes like this. Jessica, completely blinded, not knowing who was in what treatment group, would go into these rooms on assessment day, and she would basically do a physical exam. After doing this longitudinally with multiple replicates, when we unblinded her, she was then able to assign each dog to the correct treatment group just by scoring her neurological assessment. Sounds simple, maybe not that impressive, but why is it important? This is the way we can track the boys post-gene therapy. We don't want an invasive molecular readout. We want to be able to have a physician say, okay, Bobby, you've been treated with gene therapy six months ago. I'm just going to do a physical exam on you and see how well you're responding to the gene therapy and what parameters might be falling out of that therapy that we then need to pay attention to. So we're very excited about using this translationally as we go into the clinical trial. The last thing I want to show you is the immunological readout. Remember, we gave these dogs 10 to the 15th viral particles. That's a huge viral load. After administration, the top two graphs are simply showing you that the dogs do make antibodies to the viral capsid, which means the protein coat that gets transduced into these animals, they will make antibodies to that. However, the bottom graph shows that these dogs don't make antibodies to the transgenic protein. And you might think, well, that's not surprising. It's a recombinant, it's a dog protein. You've just replaced what the dog should have in its muscles. However, remember, in these mutant dogs, they're what's called a genetic null. They've never had this protein expressed. So it's highly likely that if you give them this transgenic protein that they've never seen before, that they're going to mount an, an immune response against it. Luckily, in our case, they don't. Okay, I could show you a lot more data. However, the proof is really in just watching these movies. So on the left is an affected, untreated animal at 17 weeks of age. And I know for all of this, some of these movies are going to be a little difficult to watch. So unable to support its own weight. Uh, when the animal is unable to get to its own food, and even if it could, it loses its masticatory muscles, so it can't swallow very well, can't chew its food and swallow very well. For our purposes, that's what we consider euthanasia criteria. But on the right is a litter mate of the dog on the left, 11 weeks after gene therapy. So that's what all that data really means. All that quantitative data that I showed you, that tells the story better than a lot of the data I showed you. Okay, so where are we? 
Again, we're trying to take this into clinical trial, so we've partnered with a company called Audentes Therapeutics. It's a company out of San Francisco. They've now raised $140 million to take this gene therapy to clinical trial. Uh, we are cautiously optimistic that uh, this will go off without a hitch. What we're doing now is putting together this investigative new drug application. And for those of you who have never, that doesn't mean anything to you, this is one of those documents that's gonna be this tall. It's gonna be probably three, four, 5,000 pages of documentation that we then send to the FDA and say, here's what we can do, here are our assessments for efficacy and lack of toxicity, how quickly can we give this therapy to boys with this disease? So I'm very happy to report that uh, patients are being enrolled. There's now a natural history study underway to track what the disease looks like in these boys. And there's also what's called uh, an evaluation of disease presentation in infants. So we've decided to intervene where we think we can do the most good. That is to say, the earlier we intervene, the less chance that the pathology is irreversible. So we've decided as soon as the infants can handle the huge viral load that we're gonna give, up, give them, we're going to intervene relatively early, months of age. And we hope to be able to do this sometime in 2017. Audentes is a publicly traded company, so that's all I'm allowed to say about the timeline. Okay, so this is more preliminary data. This is what we're working on now. The next experiment I wanna show you is this so-called late rescue. What do I mean by that? So remember, I showed you the data from the dose finding study where we intervened, we gave the gene therapy at 10 weeks, about halfway through their downward progression. I've had the privilege of attending the CNM, Central Nuclear Myopathy, MTM family conferences. Those are events that are held every other year in venues much like this, where we all get together with the families from all over the country who have boys with this disease and we exchange, the scientists tell the, sci the state of the science, and the families talk about and try to come to, uh, they try to help each other with what it means to, to care for a boy that has a disease like this. So it's one of the most moving experiences I've ever had. <laughs> but it doesn't take long when we start talking about the gene therapy and that we're gonna treat infants. The parents say, great, we're all for it, very supportive, go, 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 go. But what about my guy, okay? He's three, six, 10 years old. What are you gonna do for him? So we did a series of experiments to ask, can a single dose of this gene therapy reverse the pathology of this disease? So this is gonna be hard to watch. We got special approval to let these animals get really, really sick, okay? Oh. I did the same thing. So this is dog number 107, and I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. So this animal is very close to euthanasia criteria, cannot support its own weight for more than just a couple seconds, has lost the ability to feed itself. It's been hand fed for weeks now. But most importantly, it's, also, it's lost so much muscle mass in its torso, in its rib cage, in its diaphragm, that it's at the risk of spontaneously stopping breathing. That is to say, when it lays down to sleep, it doesn't even have the muscle capacity to lift and expand its chest to breathe properly. So this animal is at very, very high risk. And again, I know this is for all of us who love dogs, this is kind of hard to watch. So then, just, so that day, we assessed this animal. The next week, we gave them our mid-dose of gene therapy. So two weeks after treatment, this is what happens. 
Thank you. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> okay, this is what happens two weeks after that. Okay, yes, I agree, very dramatic. However, we treated another animal that did not respond. So Mother Nature went, uh uh, not so fast. Why might that be? So this animal has been adopted by one of the families and they renamed it Hope. I love it. But the dog that did not respond was even sicker. So our theory is that there's so little muscle mass in the dog, there's nothing to target. There's nothing for the virus to sit down on. So why we th while we think we can reverse the pathology, there appears to be a threshold that we can't go past, okay? And that's what we're working on now, to try to figure out what the molecular underpinnings are for that threshold. Okay, so as encouraging as these results are, I showed you that Pavlov and Turing are able to survive four years after gene therapy. This and other studies in hemophilia and other gene therapy studies, we think, don't hold me to this, but we think this treatment may last a decade, which as treatment goes, that is incredibly durable. However, if we treat an infant, that's still not a lifetime. So, what are the immune consequences of when we have to repeat dose these dogs or the boys, okay? Remember, we gave them a huge viral load, so we've immunized them in a big way. So we can't use AAV8, we can't use that virus again, or we would have a huge immune response. So the grant we just wrote is to try to create a hybrid virus that can elude the immune system because the dogs, it's, it's enough of the virus that recognizes muscle, it delivers the cargo, it does everything we want it to do, but it doesn't get recognized by the immune system. If we can't do that, the alternative approach is called plasmapheresis, which basically means we take out all of the blood from the dog, run it through a filter that takes out all the antibodies that recognize the virus, and we basically make the dog a, a clean slate so we can use the same gene therapy again. That's the grant we just wrote. We don't know the answer yet, but that's what we're working on. So I just wanna thank everyone that's contributed to this, uh, to this project. It's been a huge team effort. And I also want to thank our funding agencies. So this is funded by the federal government. We have an R01 to do that. But in ways that I never thought I would be part of, um, the family foundations who strongly support our work has been really fulfilling. But it's, I don't know if any of you have had this opportunity, but um, it's a daunting feeling when someone gives you money and they say, okay, this is for our boys. Now go do something great, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. And of course the families. These guys endure so much and they have been so supportive of what we do. I'm just uh, thrilled to be part of this community. As Bob said in the introduction, I started out doing yeast genetics and now I'm looking these patients in the eye and saying, yeah, we're gonna try to get this into the clinic and trying to get this to you to help you as quick as possible. So that's been my professional progression and I wouldn't trade it for anything. All right, thanks for listening. Thank you.